Hello friends. Today we're going to be talking about how to read scripture. We're not going to be looking at uh, any particular scripture. We're going to be talking about how to read scripture in general. And, and I think a lot of us have trouble with scripture, mostly because <clears throat> we've been given one method to read it, which is basically to take it literally. Uh, and that's not always the most helpful method. It's um, not only not always helpful, but it's um, often you know, not what the writer had uh, in mind, <laughs> not, not what the writer intended. Um, so that can be problematic. So um, what we're going to be doing today is, first of all, taking a look at a variety of different ways that people do read scripture, um, just to... Uh, just to explore the possibilities. Um, and then we're going to be really focusing on one particular method that is really helpful for folks today. Now, when we, when we think about scripture, we usually think of something that someone, uh, usually a man, um, wrote down a long time ago, um, something that has absolutely nothing to do with us now, um, and so has no relevance or bearing on our lives. But um, I think that's not often the case, or even not usually the case. So let's let's sort out the the, the truth from um, our assumptions here. First of all, uh, most scripture was written <clears throat> a long time ago, and usually by men. So yeah, that's that's true. Um, <clears throat> but what about the rest of it? I mean, does it have absolutely nothing to do with uh, with us now? Does it have no relevance for <clears throat> for our lives, no bearing on our lives? <clears throat> um, I think that is much more up for debate, and in fact, I don't think we should be even bothering with Scripture if it doesn't. So uh, that kind of, <laughs> kind of reveals uh, my take on it. In fact, I think Scripture has a lot to say to us in our personal lives, um, and, uh, and we'll get to why. But first of all, let's take a look at uh, some different methods of reading scripture. <clears throat> first of all, uh, there is the, the time-honored one that most of us have received, and that is the literal reading. This is where we just take the scripture at face value. Um, it's where we uh, focus on the plain meaning of the text. Um, we take it literally, we take it seriously, and at the extremes of it, we, we take it as being... Um, uh, divinely revealed and inerrant and, uh, and cannot be questioned. Um, and indeed, that is, a, that is a way that a lot of people read Scripture. But another time-honored way of reading Scripture is as allegorical. And this is where we see everything in the Scripture as symbolic of something else. And so uh, this leads to a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of really imaginative interpretations. It leads to a lot of really profound insights. Um, and it, it allows us to bring our imaginations uh, to the text um, in, a, uh, in a way that, that, that often surprises us um, and, um, uh, and yields some pretty interesting results. Um, this, like I said, is, is, is a really ancient way of reading scripture. Um, it, uh, in the Jewish tradition, it goes back to about, um, uh, into the second century BCE where, um, uh, Philo was a Jewish theologian who is, who kind of pioneered this reading, um, and his works are full of symbolic, um, explications of the, the, of the, uh, of the Jewish scriptures. Um, in the Christian tradition, Origen, uh, one of the greatest uh, theologians of the early church picked up this uh, this method and really ran with it, um, and um, uh, and in fact, it became throughout the Middle Ages the preferred way of reading scripture uh, in the Catholic tradition. Um, more recently, um, Jung um, approached scripture uh, in this way um, as being. Uh, representative of archetypal realities um, and 
and very often even synchronicity uh, plays a role in uh, what we're reading and what it is uh, and how it applies to to our lives. It's a really, really very rich uh, kind of uh, way of, of approaching uh, scripture that uh, that Jung uh, uh, the way Jung reads it. Um, and then in the um, uh, uh, Sanatana Dharma tradition, um, what scholars uh, uh, and we in the West mistakenly call the Hindu tradition, um, we've got uh, Sri Aurobindo, who reads scripture in a way that's very similar to the way that um, uh, that Jung did, in fact, um, as everything as being symbolic of something else. Um, really a fascinating uh, way of doing it, and I suggest that if you want to try something uh, in your um, daily devotions that is uh, a little off the beaten track and might really surprise you, um, to choose a piece of scripture from any tradition at random and apply this method to it. Kind of amazing. Um, uh, that noise in the background is my dog Sally. So, so <laughs> sorry about Sally's intrusion here. Um, another way of reading scripture is um, moral. And this is to say that, that every story in scripture has something to teach us about morality. Um, and so uh, sometimes you really have to stretch the story to get it to yield some kind of moral result. And indeed, people go to great lengths to make that happen. Uh, nevertheless, there are people who read scripture this way. Another way uh, that is kind of similar to the allegorical is the anagogical, um, and this is where everything in the text points to a metaphysical reality. So uh, it's a little more focused than the allegorical. Um, uh, Kabbalists were really big on this uh, method of reading scripture. It's, uh, as I said, very metaphysical. Um, another useful method is the devotional method, and that is where we don't really take into account what the writer intended. What we're really focusing on is the feelings and thoughts that are being evoked in the reader. So what is coming up for me as I read this scripture? What is the divine saying to me as I read this text? Um, if you've ever done anything like Lectio Divina, um, which uh, is a method of reading scripture in a contemplative fashion, um, that's, a, that's a good example of this kind of reading, this kind of devotional reading. But this brings us to uh, the last uh, method of reading scripture, which is the historical critical, and um, that is the one that we'll be focusing on here. Because, in fact, it's the method that most contemporary scholars employ. Um, the others are very useful in their own contexts, um, but certainly among more progressive spiritual communities, the historical critical method has the pride of place, um, and that for very good reason. <coughs> so, first of all, I'd like to set a couple of foundation stones for our exploration of this method. First of all, scripture, any scripture, was not written for you. You were not even a twinkle in the author's eye when this scripture was written down. The author had no idea that you would someday exist or that our society would exist, and they don't have any clue about what we're going through now. So let's just set that one down in stone. Scripture was not written with you in mind. Second, all scripture is written to address a crisis in the author's community. And this one is a little hard to get our heads around sometimes, um, mostly because we often confuse the <clears throat> chronology of the events being reported in a text and the very often hundreds of years later when the text is actually being set down. What's important is the moment that the text is being set down on paper. That's the thing that we're really going to focus on, because um, a scripture is not written to address our crises or our community, and it wasn't uh, written to address the, any kind of crisis 
going on um, for the people that are being talked about in the scripture. <clears throat> They're being written to address something that is directly impacting the author at the time of the writing. <clears throat> people don't actually write scripture for no reason. People, you know, people have better things to do with their time. People write scripture to address a crisis that is going on in their community. All right, we're going to come back to this idea because it's vitally, vitally important. Okay, third, Scripture is not always correct. Scripture contains the wisdom of our grandfathers and our grandmothers. It tells us how they coped with the dangerous or uncomfortable situation. It doesn't tell us how we should handle our situation. It only tells us how they handled theirs. And that's that's really useful information because sometimes uh, what they did really worked and sometimes it didn't. And usually those answers are contextual. They worked in the culture at the time, but wouldn't necessarily translate to another culture or another time. But it's still really useful information because it's family history. I think the best way to look at scripture is to see it as a conversation between ourselves and our grandfathers and grandmothers. To, um, so I, I, in fact, I often like to say that uh, reading scripture is like arguing with grandpa. Um, it's 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 important to know uh, how how grandpa or grandma handled a situation, um, but we get to have our own opinions uh, about it. Um, to engage scripture authentically or even faithfully uh, isn't to swallow what it says wholesale, and it certainly isn't to accept. Um, what it says uncritically, or as being somehow inerrant, because Scripture is written by humans, so it isn't inerrant. Um, to engage Scripture authentically and faithfully, we need to talk back to it. We, we, we've got to hold its wisdom with reverence in, on one hand because it contains the voices of our ancestors. But we also must bring our own voice to the conversation in the other hand. And, and, and let these things have, have, have equal weight in our dialogue and in our discussion. So, so when we're reading scripture, if, we re, if we're reading it faithfully, if we're reading it fruitfully, we're reading it critically. We get to talk back to it. We get to argue with it. We get to disagree with it. We get to reframe it and reinterpret it. If we're not doing these things, then we're not really reading it faithfully. We are a part of the conversation and we need to be part of the conversation. Because scripture doesn't really show us anything from the perspective of the divine. It shows us the situation from the perspective of the humans who lived it and wrote about it. Sometimes those humans are deeply insightful and we do ourselves a disservice if, if we deny ourselves their insight because sometimes their insight is profound. But sometimes those humans are just wrong. And, and when that's true, we need to engage with them and correct the record, sometimes publicly, if we are in a, in a tradition or a situation where we're preaching or giving a Dharma talk, and we should do so proudly. Because if we are rooted in a tradition, the tradition belongs to us. We are the transmitters of the tra tradition now, and, and we often get to say what should be transmitted and how. Finally, and this is really important too. Scripture is almost never about what it's about. <clears throat> Meaning, I know that, that's a cryptic saying. All right, Scripture is never about what it's about. The author is not repeating verbatim the founder's words at his, as, as, as they're remembered by the community. And <clears throat> the author is not just writing down a story as the author has received it. Whenever the writer of scripture is writing something down, remember that they are addressing a crisis that is going on in their community at the time they are writing. So if they're writing about an event that happened 200 years ago, when they write it down, they're gonna tell it slant in order to speak to the crisis 
that is going on in the present as they write. So when I ask you to take a look at the text and, and think about what the crisis is, the crisis is not going to be in the life of the character in the story. The character in the story may have lived hundreds or even thousands of years ago, uh, and yes, there's a crisis in the story, but the writer is telling that story in order to address a crisis going on in the writer's community at the time of the writing. And so they're going to reinterpret the story. They're going to tell it a little bit different. They're going to give it a spin in order to speak to the crisis going on in the community at the time that they're writing. And so the real crisis is almost never spoken of directly in the scripture. It's happening off stage. It's happening off stage from the scripture itself. This is happening in the context of the culture that the writer is writing in. And so this is why it's important for us to know the history that uh, uh, surrounding the writing of a particular piece of scripture so that we can know what's going on in the community. And often there's clues of this in the text, right? Um, because the author is very pointedly writing about something. Uh, he or she is just not telling us what that something is directly. Um, but history gives us some good clues. Uh, the tradition that uh, the writer is writing in gives us some good clues about this. Often commentators tell us directly what that crisis is. So this is why research is really important when we address a scripture, because we want to, we need to figure out what that crisis is bef before we can figure out what the text is actually about. Because as I said, scripture is never about what it's about. It's about something happening off stage that the writer is trying to address in his own community. Okay, so um, you may have to go back and listen to that again. I know because it's a it's a it's a it's a very non-intuitive concept, um, <clears throat> but it's vitally important for us to <clears throat> understand um, how to read scripture um, and how to understand what's actually going on in, in the scripture. So um, pl please try to keep these things in mind as we approach the Upanishads and one of the um, early Buddhist sutras.